Okay, in this lesson we are talking about homeostasis still, but more specifically about feedback mechanisms. We're still in Unit 2, Topic 1, and we are carrying on from our last uh, lesson. All right, so to recap, we are talking about external stimuli from the body. It's causing disturbances in the normal planned functioning of the body. Your body has to detect what's going on. It's trying to correct this by bringing the systems back within normal ranges and to maintain that dynamic equilibrium. To do this, your nervous system and your endocrine system are the main corrective mechanisms. And that's what we're talking about in this one. So in order to correct things, firstly, your body must use the stimulus response model. Um, so lots going on here, basically. And we use positive and negative feedback mechanisms, right? Feedback means you're kind of getting that information back to you so you can make a new decision, like handing in a, an assignment draft. Um, and there's a lot going on. So your body receives some stimulus, a receptor is detecting it, right? It might be um, a nervous system or it might be, so, you know, a, any kind of chemo receptor, for example. You're then getting information to your control center like your brain or your central nervous system. Your body then has to use what's known as an effector, like a muscle or an endocrine gland to make that change. And then the response should be systematic, or it could be localized, so it could apply to the whole body, or it might just be specific to one organ or muscle. Now, there are two kinds of feedback mechanisms. One are negative feedback loops, and they keep the internal environment as stable as possible. We're talking again about that dynamic equilibrium. Now, dynamic equilibrium here, we're talking that up and down steadying that, say, an air conditioner might do in a room. Air conditioner is a really good example of this. So you keep the door open to the, air, uh, to the room. Your air conditioner wants to be set at 24 degrees, but you're letting in hot air. So it detects that actually I need to work a bit harder it works a bit harder it cools the room down and the room hits say 20 degrees and then it goes actually I'll pull back now because it's quite cold and I'll stop working until it warms up again so that's that's a negative feedback cycle in a positive feedback loop though it's kind of counterintuitive it's a way to escalate the response to keep it going down the same path um, and it pushes that internal environment to keep escalating the same thing it was doing so it's amplifying that response and if we looked at it on a graph this kind of steadying up and down motion you, you know you can imagine that that air conditioner but if you're looking at this one it doesn't seem like a normal response but in some situations it is all right, negative feedback mechanisms are really easy to get our head around. It involves a response that is the reverse of the change that is detected, okay? And we ebb and flow around that central normal point, right? If this is our ideal value and something is changing up, our body tries to correct it back down and then it might overshoot it and tries to bring it back to the middle again. So a change is detected by a receptor and an effector is activated to induce an opposite effect all right and that's promoting the equilibrium um, really good mega, uh, negative feedback mechanisms are thermoregulation so your body regulating your temperature uh, same kind of idea as that air conditioner again so if the body temperature changes these mechanisms are induced to restore those normal levels if you're cold you shiver your body warms up if you're overheating you sweat your body cools down and back and forth we go um, another negative feedback mechanism uh, is blood sugar regulation so if you haven't had a meal in a while your body will produce the hormone called glucagon which raises your blood glucose from stored um, glucose, you know, it's called glycogen and the opposite. If you have just eaten, your body will produce a hormone called insulin, which allows your body to intake that sugar osmoregulation or how much water uh, your body has. There's a hormone called ADH. It's secreted to retain water when you're feeling dehydrated. So you don't just pee it all out. All right, positive feedback mechanisms are, again, the amplification or that escalation of a response. And it's kind of a strange, vicious cycle. And the output of the original reaction enhances the stimulus. And it's a bit strange to think about. One way um, that you probably are familiar with is when you buy a bunch of bananas, uh, bananas actually produce this chemical called ethylene. And it, it happens when fruits ripen. So the banana is ripening, producing ethylene. And that ethylene actually promotes the other bananas around it to ripen as well. So you've got one banana, it ripens another one, the other one becomes ripe and it keeps producing it. So it's actually really easy to overripen your bananas because they're sitting there all spitting out this ethylene and then all ripening each other until two days later you've got brown bananas. 
So when we talk about this pattern of behavior, it means the response started and then actually it's escalated so quickly that it just keeps going and going. Now your body, um, so there's the, the fruit example, your body fighting a fever is the same thing. Okay, As your body fights the disease, your metabolic rate or what your cells are doing, that increases. So there's more heat actually produced and then your body just goes, oh, the temperature's risen again. I'll keep working harder and harder. And it is that vicious problem of going around and actually, oh, it's going to keep happening. A really good example of this is uh, breastfeeding or lactation. So your body knows it has to start preparing to feed its young when, say, you become pregnant. Um, and what happens is this hormone called prolactin is produced. Now, when you're getting pregnant, also uh, a, a hormone called progesterone is uh, produced and it helps uh, kind of thicken the uterus to keep the baby intact there. Um, but actually progesterone inhibits prolactin. So as soon as that, that um, person becomes pregnant, there's no more prolactin until the person gives birth, right? So then the progesterone decreases significantly and it gives this cue for prolactin to be produced all of a sudden. It's like, hey, the baby's out. We need to start feeding it. The issue then is that as soon as the baby starts actually doing the breastfeeding or suckling at the nipple, more and more prolactin keeps coming out. And the problem then becomes is how do we stop that milk production? Um, and stopping milk production can be slow and it can be really, really painful to train your body that that stimulus is no longer there. Please stop producing milk. Quite a lot of confusing diagrams. You are going to see this one straight out of Pearson. Okay, when we talk about homeostasis, we have to talk about metabolism. And metabolism is all of those, uh, it's like the sum total of all of the biochemical reactions in your body. So um, when we discuss these mechanisms, just going to rewind, the body has to maintain that equilibrium and it's all related to the reactions that are happening in the cells. And now there's two kinds of these reactions. Anabolic reactions are things that build smaller, tiny little molecules into bigger ones. So we're talking protein synthesis or even photosynthesis because we're taking small molecules and building it to a really big glucose molecule. The opposite of that is cat or catabolic reactions, and we're taking bigger molecules and breaking them down into smaller molecules. And the best way to remember this is, you know, anabolic steroids build me up and my cat tore everything to shreds. Now, the problem becomes that we understand that everything has to be optimal, but if something changes, then the enzymes get affected, right? We understand that metabolism requires enzymes, and as soon as something changes, the enzymes won't work as well. They have that perfect little ideal environment. So the enzymes are not in the optimal, the metabolic rate slows down. If the metabolic rate has slowed down due to a lack of the normal functioning, it corrects and the enzyme activity is not optimal anyway. So it's this weird chicken and egg situation. The metabolism needs the enzymes, but the enzymes need the system to maintain optimal conditions. So they go hand in hand. And if we're talking managing multiple systems that need corrections, it can be really quite complex. If the correction is required, then the enzyme activity may not be optimal. And our correcting mechanisms um, Really, our, the efficiency of this relies on so many things. It relies on the metabolic rate and the conditions or the speed at which your body is doing all those chemical reactions. And it's really important to know how far away from the normal the system is straying, right? You're talking, uh, am I hypothermic or is it just cold in Brisbane today and it's, you know, 15 degrees? We also have to be thinking about what effector is being used. Do I need to engage a muscle? Do I need to engage a whole system behavior change? Or do I have to produce a hormone all of a sudden? And those things are going to change how efficient those correcting mechanisms are. All right. As I said in the last lesson, there is quite a lot in this unit. So please make sure you do some reading.